Well, good morning. Good morning. It's good to be with you all this morning. And as we uh, think about the topic today, um, dealing with abortion, we're looking at the title is Abortion and the Bible. And I'll just say at the beginning, it's it can be a delicate topic. And so my my desire is to deal with it compassionately and yet at the same hand honestly and boldly firmly um, so that we can so you can understand my position and maybe be firmly rooted in your own position uh, which we want to be in line with the word of god Uh, so we are in an election year as you all know and with politics being a hot topic um, and, and to be honest from from a position in the pulpit, it's easier many times just to avoid anything political. But that's not necessarily possible. Because any, any statement I make regarding the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is in and of itself political. Because He is coming to establish Himself as a political ruler over the earth. Now, we don't know what day that is, but we believe from a Christian worldview that that absolutely will happen, and so that is a political issue. It's a political issue that unbelieving rulers of this world do not like to hear. So we can't entirely abstain from politics, and when when politics enter the moral realm, which they do and they're supposed to, There are times when we have to deal with those moral issues, and abortion is one of those. This is a moral topic. It's not just a political topic that should be isolated from a biblical worldview. The issue of abortion is a moral topic. And much of, not everything necessarily, to the same degree, but much of politics is in the moral realm. And so we might address more of that later and, and I will say from the beginning that as I begin to put this message together, I realize, as often I do, probably should be two or three messages. There's going to be more material that I would like to present than I will be able to today. Uh, but I, I have tried to, uh, to basically hit some high points for the message today. And so I'll say this right out front. You know, abortion is the killing of a baby. And it's murder. And that sounds really harsh. And we want to talk about it a little bit later. I might bring up why we don't hear it explained that way. But it's it's true. And yet at the same time, it's, it's commonplace And there is hope, there is redemption for anyone who has participated in that. It's not a lost cause that has doomed your future for anyone who has participated in that. So, And we want to deal with that at the end of the message. We want to deal with the issue of of hope and redemption briefly. And and maybe I should have allotted a lot more time for that. But anyway, as as a... a little bit of a background. We, we have a tendency in our thinking, I know I do, to think of abortion as being a modern issue. And I'll say right from the beginning, it's not. In fact, we're going to look at some scriptural issues that are connected to abortion. But one of the reasons we think of it as being a modern issue is, is as many of you are aware, the Roe v. Wade decision in 1973 where the Supreme Court declared that there was a, I don't know if they called it a constitutional right, but at least a federal right to abortion. And so prior to that, there was uh, perhaps a lot of undercover and more illegal practice of abortion. And then since that time, it's it's just been legal in a wide, uh, in a general way. And in in a couple years ago, in 2022, the Supreme Court again ruled, and it ruled differently this time, 
taken away that federal protection, or that federal right to abortion. And so now it's thrown back to the, each state to determine the legality of abortion. Now, as you know, many of the, of the liberal side of, of things have seemingly come unglued on this issue. And they, they make up uh, a lot of propaganda regarding that decision because that decision did not ban, that did not impose a federal ban on abortion. All it did in 2022 was throw the legality back to each individual state. And so it, it went back to kind of what it was before 1973. And so it's some of the hype and, and the, the loud uh, screaming and, and wailing of the 2022 decision is largely propaganda. It was not a federal ban. <clears throat> but this, this has, and, and I've seen this prior to 2022, but has been even more pronounced in the last two years that there are a, a number of false terms. The, the, the deception around abortion has increased by, by changing the terminology and describing it in ways that's not accurate. And, and it, things like, um, they'll use the term reproductive rights, women's rights. Or they'll, make, they'll, call, they'll call into question, does a woman have control over her own body, or does the government? Now, all, all of that is, is based on deception. Those terms and, and those ideas... And so it reminds me of um, that book, and I think I've talked about it before, that I read a couple years ago um, by Rod Dreher. It's called Live Not by Lies. And I think a few of you have read that as well. Live Not by Lies. And it's, a, it's an excellent book. And the, the premise of that is when, when, a, when a government, a human government, begins propaganda, and he was basing it largely on Russia, and the propaganda machine coming out of that government that everybody knew was not accurate. But people just went along. And he said all it would have taken to stop that is for people to speak up and call out a lie every time they heard it. And that's what is surrounding this abortion issue. I think, I think there's times when we need to speak up and call it for what it is. Abortion is not reproductive rights. It's murder. And, and we shouldn't use terminology regarding abortion that deceives or misconstrues it into something different than what it is. It's not reproductive rights. As we think about that, that, the U.S. government is not, in viol is not violating reproductive rights, such as like China. For years, China has had a one-child policy, and that is a, is a violation of reproductive freedom or reproductive rights. Because that, that policy declared for years that if you had more than one child, the second child must be put to death or you would pay a hefty fine to keep it. And therefore, eliminating the free exercise of people to have as large a family as they want without huge financial burdens. That's a violation of reproductive freedom. In the United States, we don't have anything similar to that. In fact, if we're going to allow the, the term reproductive right... The violation is on the side of those who are promoting abortion. Because see, every one of us that's sitting here in this room are here as a result of reproductive freedom and a reproductive right. But abortion is what actually defies that right. It takes what has been reproduced and tries to eliminate it. That is a violation of reproductive right. 
It, it violates the freedom of the person who, is, who has been conceived. And so we want to we look at that. <clears throat> the issue is not about reproductive right. The issue at stake is, does a mother or a doctor or whoever have the right to terminate that which has reproduced? Or the result of reproduction? <clears throat> One of the things that really got me onto this topic was just in the past uh, couple weeks, I heard, and this is just to give you a little background, but I think the story is pertinent and we need to think it through because it's, it's an example of how many people think. But most of you know who Steph Curry is, and if not, he's one of the most famous basketball players today, maybe one of the most famous athletes in the world today. And, and he, in a recent interview, he, he has been an open uh, supporter of, of Vice President Harris, who, by the way, is from California and is from San Francisco, where Steph Curry lives. And so I understand he personally knows her, and he's been an advocate for her. And in a recent interview, just a few weeks ago perhaps, he was asked about his support for Kamala Harris as she runs for president. And he, he insisted that it was, it was an important election and it's, it's an interesting time that we live in and he felt convicted to be strongly in favor of Kamala Harris instead of staying neutral like some athletes will tend to do. And so the, the reporter asked him, well, what what about her? What is the important thing about her that makes you promote her? And he said, it's, about, it's not about her as a person necessarily, I'm saying it in my own words, but it's about the issues and, and, and the issues that she supports. And the report said, so what issue is most important to you? His answer was women's rights. And he went on to clarify that as reproductive rights. Now, he did not use the word abortion, but it was clear that's what he was talking about. The issue of abortion. And this is coming from a, a very well-known, famous basketball player who is also an outspoken Christian. And he, he puts Bible verses on his shoes, I believe, for every game. And he has been unashamed of his faith in Christ. And, and, and in some ways, fairly bold for a, for a well-known athlete. And yet at the same time, the number one issue in voting this fall for him is the issue of abortion and that people have that right and that liberty. And that stumped me. I mean, I was, because I, I have been a fan of Steph Curry's. I enjoy basketball and I, I admire his game. He seems like a genuinely nice person. He seems authentic. And yet that gave me serious pause when I heard him say his number one issue is abortion. And he's for abortion. And, and Harris and, and Walls, um, her running mate, they are extremely pro-abortion. In fact, they have made that almost the central issue for them as they run for office. And, and, and a lot of times they will use a terminology regarding women's reproductive rights. And no one is calling them as candidates for office. No one is calling them out, or at least very seldom, not in the news. People are not calling them out as pro-murder. As pro-baby killers. But that's essentially what they are. And that may sound shocking. But the terminology regarding abortion has been so watered down that people do not call it for what it is. 
And the practice has become commonplace. Now, what is interesting, at least interesting to me, is this abortion issue is nothing new. It is not a modern invention. It is not something that has just been practiced in the last 50 years, since 1973. It had a widespread practice before that, even in the United States. And it's not just a, a modern issue such as in the last 100 years or 150 years. But it is an age-old issue. In fact, there are historical evidence and archaeological evidence of this practice existing for thousands of years. And the Bible has some interesting things to say about that, so we're going to look at that. Um, but when we look at the Bible and what the Bible says, the Bible deals with a, a more common practice in its day that's called child sacrifice. But it is very much related to the issue of abortion. The, the finer details are a little different, but the same concept is there. And so we're going to look at that in a little bit as well. So we want, to, we want to think about what saith the Scripture. That's how we want to determine our worldview and our specific view regarding this issue is what saith the Scripture. What does God think about this issue? So to get started, look in Luke chapter 1. If you turn to Luke chapter 1, <clears throat> and, and here in Luke chapter 1, it's given the account of uh, the, the background of the birth of Christ and, and even prior to that, the birth of John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist was a cousin to the Lord Jesus Christ and he was about six months older. And so we're going to break into the account here of where Elizabeth, John the Baptist's mother, is pregnant. She is expecting John the Baptist Mary has just become pregnant with the Lord Jesus Christ supernaturally through the Holy Spirit. And so she goes to, and it's a, you know, it's a strange, a strange situation for Mary because she has not yet married Joseph, her husband. She has not had a physical relationship yet with, with Joseph. And yet she is pregnant. And so she goes to her cousin, or uh, Elizabeth, and talks with her because she is aware that Elizabeth is expecting a child as well. And expecting John the Baptist, who is a prophet. So we're going to break in here in, in verse uh, 39, Luke chapter 1, verse 39. <clears throat> and Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb. This is John the Baptist. He's, he's about six months along. You know, a, a human gestation period is nine months. John the Baptist is six months along, and he leaps in Elizabeth's womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost, and she spake with a loud voice, saying, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And we'll stop there. But do you notice what the Word of God calls the person in Elizabeth's womb? A babe. The Word of God doesn't call it a fetus. It doesn't call it... Um, a potential human being. He calls it a babe. It's a, it's a baby. And not only that, but that baby responds. It reacts independently of the mother. And that baby is reacting because that baby has recognized or identified the Lord Jesus Christ who has just been conceived in the womb of Mary. Now, this is all very fascinating. There are four people involved here. 
There's Mary, Elizabeth, John the Baptist, and Jesus. And two of those individuals have been unborn. And the Word of God identifies them as babies. So that's, that's important to understand. And so it's fascinating that the first person in human history to identify the hum, human form of the Lord Jesus Christ is none other than an unborn baby, John the Baptist. And it said he leaped in the womb. <clears throat> now, if we jump back to Genesis, first book of your Bible, Genesis 25. <clears throat> And we're going to try to move along pretty quick here. So hopefully we get most of this covered today. And I'm, I'm skipping over. There's a lot more verses and, and things we could go to. Um, but for the sake of time, I'm just kind of hitting a few high points, like I said. But Genesis chapter 25, and this is the issue of Isaac and Rebekah. And Rebekah is, um, is expecting twins. Well, what, what, the, this will tell the story. Look at verse 22. Genesis 25, tw uh, 21. Sorry, verse 21. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was, in, she was barren. That means she was unable to have children. And the Lord was entreated of him. And Re Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children struggled together within her. Now notice... Here again, the Word of God, she's conceived, it's twins, they're still in her womb, and the Word of God calls it children. There's two of them. It's children. <clears throat> so we already have identified that the Word of God calls it a baby. Here it calls it children. Now turn over to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Toward, toward the end of the book of Psalms. Psalm 139, we'll start in verse 13. <clears throat> and this is a psalm of David, and he's, he's doing some self-reflection, some deep meditation, and in verse 13, he says, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Now, that might be, at the surface, that might seem kind of hard to understand. But you know what he's saying here? He's saying, he's saying I was wrought in secret in my mother's womb. When, when no one else could observe it, Science can't even hardly explore it. And that's why he says in, in the verse 15, he says, I was wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. That's like, that's like a deep cave that we're unable to explore. It's, it's shielded in darkness. And, and we don't know, you know physically what all might go on down in a deep cave or whether it could sustain life. Or we know there's a... There, it's just impossible sometimes to explore very deep. And it's impossible to observe what's going on because of the lack of light, maybe the lack of oxygen. And so we physically are limited when we think about the lowest parts of the earth, whether it's the depths of the sea or a deep cave. There's, there's large amounts of deep sea or ocean that scientists still cannot explore. We just physically can't do it. And that's what... David is comparing to the womb. We can't really understand what's going on there. We're very up until modern times, scientists had very little knowledge of what was going on in a womb. 
from the moment of conception. And now with modern science, we know a lot more, but there's still a lot of unknown. And, and, and this verse is, or these verses talk about God possessing my reins. That's like our, our personal makeup. Our, our, it, it could be termed our worldview to a certain extent, but like our own individual DNA. God, God possessed all that. And, and we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And he says, he says, my substance, when, when I began at the moment of conception, he said, God knew me completely. Before anyone else did, he says, thine eyes, so the Lord's eyes did see my substance being yet unperfect. He said, before I was complete. We talk about perfect there, he's being complete. It wasn't even a completely formed baby in its anatomy. A completely formed what we would identify as a human being, it was just cells. And God knew everything about that individual. God knew what their members were, He goes on to say. In verse 16, And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. In other words, He said, before I grew fingers, arms, and toes, God knew exactly how I would turn out. And He had it written and coded in my DNA before I ever began to form everything. God identifies the unborn from the moment they're conceived. God identifies the unborn as a unique human that He has encoded with DNA to be as a specific, unique individual. God has determined all that from the beginning. <clears throat> That's fascinating to think about. So God identifies in the womb. A baby is a baby, for one. It's a child. We looked at the verse that calls them children. And it has unique personhood. Now it's not, this is not about the rights of a woman over her body. There is a separate life going on there from the woman's body. The woman is just giving a temporary time to sustain and care for that new life. But it is a separate life. That's why you can have a stillborn child or a, a child can die in the womb and yet the mother lives on. Or vice versa. There's times when a, a mother will die and they can still save the baby because it's two individual lives. They are, they are, yes, they're connected, but they're also independent lives from one another. And by the way, modern pro-abortion people will, will selectively identify a few scientists to, to promote the idea that life begins at birth. But the overwhelming scientific community is on the side that life begins at conception. And we see the Bible backing that up or agreeing with that. Or in fact, maybe we should say science largely is in agreement with the, what the Word of God has already said. Life begins at conception. And so that which is in the womb is a person. Now, as we think about that being a child, a person, to terminate that life would be murder. And, and I think, and this is where it really hit me hard, that like people like Steph Curry... And there's many other just like him. They someday they will have to answer to, and I'm not judging whether he's saved or not. That's a separate issue. But he will have to answer to God someday for his hypocrisy with this issue. Because I know for a fact, Steph Curry and, and many others are, are strong advocates of 
of some sort of gun control. And I, I don't know exactly where he falls on that, but some sort of gun control. The, whether it's and, and I know that's perhaps one of the reasons why he promotes Harris is she has already in the past promoted a confiscation of certain guns, a buyback program, so that everybody has to give up their gun. And, and so he is in favor of some sort of gun control. Why? Because he has determined that guns sometimes kill innocent people. And he's concerned enough with those innocent people that he is willing to seemingly violate individual rights of gun ownership or of self-protection in order to protect a few innocent people. Now, that's not just Steph Curry. That's a lot of, a lot of people that agree with him. They're willing to violate certain constitutional rights in order to protect what they believe is some innocent people who die by guns. That is a major hypocritical position for everyone who agrees with him to be also pro-abortion because that is the murder of an innocent life. And by the way, if I would get shot and killed accidentally, we might call that an innocent life that was taken. But people could dig into my life and find wrong things. They could find sin or, or evil I've committed in the past and say, well, look at this and this. Maybe he was deserving to die. See, that argument could be made, but that argument can never be made for an unborn child. There are no more, there is nothing more innocent regarding human life than an unborn child. And if we're going to protect innocent people from getting shot at and killed, how can you not also want to protect an unborn child who has never committed a sin? never has had any blameworthiness, which we have all had that have lived life. How? How can they reconcile that? And I think it's impossible. That's why they need to be called out. And I would love, and I know I never will, but I would love to have a conversation with Steph Curry to ask him that. How do you reconcile those two positions? What does God think about killing of innocent people? Psalm or Proverbs 6, you don't have to turn there, but it's a very, um, a very well-known proverb. Proverbs 6 is dealing with the seven things that God hates. It says a well, verse 16, Proverbs 6, 16, these six things doth God hate, the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. And it goes on with the list there, but that's the one we want. Look, God, of of seven major things that God has laid out that He hates and that are an abomination unto Him, one of those is hands that shed innocent blood. And that's what abortion is. If we turn back to Leviticus... We can see, and and Leviticus is part of the law. Leviticus 18, and I want to look at a couple different passages here in Leviticus. And as we look at the law of Moses laid out back here in Leviticus, I am in no way implying that we are operating under the law of Moses, nor that the judgments for breaking that law are still in effect today. What I am trying to point out is God's attitude towards this issue. And His attitude is brought out in the law of Moses, how He views this issue, and that will inform us with a worldview regarding what God thinks and how God thinks. So let's look at this. Leviticus chapter 18 And we'll start in verse 20. It says, Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her, and thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech. 
Neither shalt thou profane the Lord, the name of thy God. I am the Lord. Now, we're not going to take the time here. But this whole chapter is about sexual immorality. And what's acceptable to God and what's not acceptable. And it, it, it be, earlier than, from these verses, it talks about sexual immorality. And later from these verses in the same chapter, it continues talking about sexual immorality. And right in the middle of it is the verse, uh, verse 20, 21, Thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech. Now what does that have to do with sexual immorality? It actually has a lot to do with it. That's why it's right in the middle of this verse. And so the Canaanites, the, to give a little background, the children of Israel were moving into the land of Canaan and God was giving them this law to separate them from other Gentile nations and He had told them to wipe out the Canaanites because He didn't want them serving the Canaanite gods. He didn't want them adopting the Canaanite ways and He didn't want the Canaanites' influence to defile Israel as His covenant chosen people. And, and God, that sounds, that sounds really harsh towards the Canaanites. But do you know what? God, God basically forced the Israelites to hang out in Egypt for 400 years. He said, because the, the, the sin of the Canaanites or the iniquity of the Canaanites is not yet full. He waited until the Canaanites were, were completely defiled, completely deserving of the wrath of God before he had Israel move out and take over the land. And so it was an act of judgment, but it was not an act of judgment until the Canaanites were fully deserving. Until they had completely been given over to wholesale idolatry, wickedness, and rebellion against God. And God is warning the Israelites, don't adopt their ways. And one of their ways was they had this God called Molech. And this God of Molech was who they offered their children to in sacrifice. Now, it doesn't take a very smart person to think about the fact that if there is a religion that just moves in and part of their worship system requires that you sacrifice your children, you bring your children to the altar, they're thrown in the fire, they die, and that's how you worship God. There's a lot of people to be driven away from that religion. That religion wouldn't have very many followers. But what happens if a culture slowly drifts away from God? They begin to defy the God of the Bible. They begin to go their own way. And they begin to live a sexual promiscuous lifestyle defying the traditional family the biblical family. You know what happens? People begin to have unwanted children as a result of that. And as they have these unwanted children, they have, they have guilt in how to deal with this. They have guilt in how to terminate or get rid of this unwanted child who is standing in the way of my personal satisfaction and lifestyle. And what better way to satisfy the conscience than come up with a religion where you can offer this unwanted child as part of your worship. And then you can take that which is clearly evil and in your mind construe it into something good. A form of worship. And that's what child sacrifice is. And then it becomes more palatable to the people. You've already got a culture and a people who have unwanted children. And so you introduce this religious system slowly by slowly as a seemingly honorable way to get rid of unwanted children. And God detested it. 
And in the middle of his instruction about sexual promiscuity in this chapter, he inserts this verse that says, Thou shalt not offer thy seed unto Molech. Because it goes hand in hand. The result of sexual promiscuity is, is over time is unwanted children. You have enough of that going on, enough unwanted children, eventually there will become some system in order for people to, to deal with that without completely defiling their conscience. <clears throat> Now, Molech was an idol. And today, we don't have an, a physical idol to come and worship and for people to offer their children to, but abortion is still connected to idolatry. It's always an exchange. It's exchanging a life for something. That's the way it was with Molech, was exchanging my life for a, a symbol of honor and worship to the god Molech. And today, they've just taken away some of that religious aspect, but it's exchanging a life for something. And it's, it has more to do with self. It's more openly about self today than what it perhaps was back in the Canaanites. But it's still idolatry in some form. Now, turn over to Leviticus chapter 20. And we'll read the first five verses here. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel, that giveth any of his seed unto Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. And I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he hath given his seed unto Molech to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. And if the people of the land do in any way hide their eyes from the man when he giveth, the seed, giveth of his seed unto Molech and kill him not, then will I set my face against that man and against his family and will cut him off and all that go a whoring after him to commit whoredom with Molech from among their people." Now here's another little bit of information about God's attitude towards this. It's, it's, a, it's a different type of abortion than what we have today, but it's still the same issue. Getting rid of unwanted children. And God's attitude is not only a prohibition from doing it, but He says when it's done, the people of Israel need to go put to death the people that committed it. Now that's getting real serious. God does not take this lightly. And again, I'm not saying we are under the law. I'm just saying this exposes God's attitude towards it. And what He thinks. Now, if we, if we turn to Psalm 106. The 106th Psalm is a, is a psalm describing Israel's history and their, their fall out of favor with God and the progression of that. And it begins from their, from their exodus and how they rebelled in the wilderness and they continued to rebel. They went into the land of Canaan and as they settled in their, their own country, they continued to rebel and defy God. And it talks about, in verse 34, it talks about basically how they hit rock bottom. Psalm 106, 34, They did not destroy the nations concern, concerning whom the Lord commanded them, but were mingled among the heathen and learned their works. And they served their idols, which were a snare unto them, Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils and shed innocent blood. Even the blood of their sons and their daughters whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan and the land was polluted with blood. Thus they were defiled with their own works and went a-whoring with their own inventions. 
Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against His people, insomuch that He abhorred His own inheritance. And He gave them into the hand of the heathen, and they that hated them ruled over them. And their enemies also oppressed them, and they were brought into subjection under their hand. Now, as we, we're not going to spend time with this whole chapter, but as, as, a, as the, the psalm lays out the downward progression of Israel, they hit rock bottom. They, they failed to drive out all the Canaanites, which God told them to do. He warned them about adopting the gods of the Canaanites, which they went ahead and did. And eventually, Israel, God's chosen people, His covenant people, His favored people, are no better than any of the Gentile nations around them. And they are committing all the same evils that the others are committing. To the point that they have adopted this practice of child sacrifice. And that seems to be the final straw before God hands them over to their enemies and He allows them to be carried away captive by the Gentile nations. <clears throat> And we know that it's, it was a commonplace issue back in that day. Now, there's, I don't know that there's a lot of archaeological evidence of Israel's child sacrifice, but there, there was uh, some, some years ago, archaeologists uncovered in, in the area of Canaan, just north of Israel, still in the area of Canaan, of I don't know how many thousand years ago, I don't remember, but I believe it was uh, somewhere around 20,000 urns of burnt remains of children. And there was enough, you know, the bones intact and everything, that they were able to identify that this was not just random children dying because all the, all the 20,000 children were consistently just a few months old. It was clear this was part of child sacrifice. And this is from thousands of years ago. <clears throat> so it's nothing new. Now in Genesis chapter 9, and this is reiterated a few other times in the Bible, but in Genesis chapter 9 as Noah is getting off the ark, there is a a mandate given to him regarding the purpose of human government. And in, in Genesis chapter 9, verse 5, and it says, And surely your blood of your lives will I require, at the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of every man, at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made He man. Now there, there's where God instituted capital punishment. And it's to curb the evil. God values human life. Why? This tells us right here. Because people are made in the image of God. Every person is made in the image of God. They bear the mark of God upon their very existence. And that's similar to what David said in Psalm 109 or 139, when he talks about God knew him in his, his innermost being before he was even formed. Because every person has the stamp of God upon them. And that's why God instituted capital punishment. He said whenever somebody is a murderer, that person is to be put to death because they've shed innocent blood. Because I care, God is basically saying, I care about every person's life. And if they disregard the life that I value, then their life should be cut off from the earth. Their life should be disregarded. And so He does that to curb evil in the world. <clears throat> and we're not going to turn there, but in Exodus chapter 21, there is an account given of, of what the children of Israel to do if, if there was a, a violent act committed against a pregnant woman so that her child died in the womb. 
And there was basically a, a probation time if the child would live and be fine, then the man was free. He would only pay for you know restitution, for monetary restitution or whatever is necessary. But if he caused the child to die, he was to be put to death. That's how God, how seriously God took that issue of protecting that unborn child. Now, in, in Proverbs 31, this is, a, this is the last proverb, last chapter of Proverbs, you might say. And it has a little verse in here that's, that pertains to this issue. So Proverbs 31.8. It says, Open thy mouth for the dumb, and in the Bible, dumb means, it doesn't mean stupid, it means unable to speak. In, in the Bible, when, when, when it talks about, it talks about the deaf and dumb a lot of times. The deaf can't hear, the dumb can't speak. So here it says, open thy mouth for the dumb, those that can't speak, in the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. In other words, this is, this is just a simple proverb saying it is the right thing to do to speak up on behalf of those who can't speak for themselves. And furthermore, it's the right thing to do to speak up for those who are fitted for destruction and they can't defend themselves. Now clearly that can apply to adults. But more emphatically, it would absolutely apply to the unborn. Instructing that it's the right thing to do to speak up for those who are unborn. To speak up on their behalf. Now, there's, there's five things, just five points I want us to, to think about that we have learned so far just looking at scriptures. Number one, the unborn child is a person. The unborn child is a person. Number two, the Bible strictly forbids the taking of innocent life. The Bible strictly forbids the taking of innocent life. See, there are times when, when killing is justified in the Bible. But innocent life is forbidden. Number three, every person is made in the image of God. That's what gives humans value over animals. That's why God permits the killing of animals, but not humans because of the fact that every person is made in the image of God. Number four, we should speak on behalf of those who have no voice. Those who cannot defend themselves. It's the right thing to do for us to speak up on their behalf. And number five, abortion is connected to idolatry. And idolatry is clearly forbidden. <clears throat> so as I've mentioned, the, the details of abortion has changed throughout history, but the general concept has been in existence probably since the early days of human history. But it's clearly condemned by God's Word. We should stand against it. It's the right thing to do to stand against it. And furthermore, it is the government's job to restrain it. In fact, we could turn to Romans chapter 13. <clears throat> Romans chapter 13. And we'll read a few verses here. It, it's clear from this passage the government's central job is to restrain evil and promote good. Now, there is a... That's always been the case since the days of Noah. That's always been the case. God instituted a form of government in which, which men would band together, form a government, and hold other people accountable to a certain moral standard. Now, that has never been more important than in the dispensation of grace. 
Because at least in time past, God Himself would intervene and enact a judgment as a warning against certain evil acts. But now God is not doing that. God has withheld His wrath. He is extending grace. But He is still left intact an agent of wrath, and that is government. And that's part of God's plan and purpose. So let's look at these verses. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. That's He's talking about the powers of government. Whoso therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Now that doesn't mean they, they, re, they receive hell. The damnation is they receive public condemnation. That's what damnation is. It's public condemnation. Verse 3, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. And by the way, if that gets changed around and we see that happen in governments today, it's because that government is out of line with the Word of God and God's purpose for government. The purpose of government is to promote good works and to restrain evil. Will thou then be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have the praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger. Now notice this. The, the, the government agency is a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Because see, God is not personally extending wrath and judgment to anyone today. But he, in order, and if there was no wrath, no judgment for any evil, we would self destruct here on earth so quickly, we would completely go down in a flame of fire. And so God has ordained human governments that they be a source of executing wrath upon the evil to restrain it. Now, that is not in conflict. I think sometimes as people who understand the, the dispensation of grace we live in, the grace of God, and that God is withholding His wrath, wrath maybe can get skewed in their idea of how to blend human government with a grace believer. It's not in conflict. See, as a grace believer, we are extending the grace of God to the other individual. That God will forgive them. That they can trust the gospel and be saved. But that in no way diminishes the accountability that that person has to the human government. See, a judge has the liberty to to stand in judgment and commit a murderer to prison or to de the death sentence and be fully in the will of God in doing so, and at the same time that judge can offer them hope through the gospel. To give them an opportunity to place their faith in their, and have eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. See, both are true. They are not in conflict with one another. What is in conflict when we individually of our own accord retaliate against evil and go out in wrath and anger and take a vengeance and see if someone breaks into your house and maybe kills a family member and you find out about it later, it is morally wrong for you to go out and hunt down that person and kill them in cold blood. That's the job of the government. But if someone is attacking you or your family member while you're there and in self-defense you kill them, then that is a justified reason from the Word of God. And so we have to just keep everything in context because the dispensation of grace does not mean that government no longer can execute wrath or that you can no longer provide self-defense. The grace of God is that God's attitude towards that sin regarding their eternal existence and their offer of eternal life. The offer of salvation, the gospel, is available 
to the murderer just as equally as it is to you and I who have committed no murder. It shows no preference in that way. That's, that's the grace of God. But human government, whether it's a judge or you know, a state trooper, they have the responsibility to execute force and whatever means necessary to carry out the rule of law. That is not in conflict with the grace of God. Because at the same time of doing that, there is opportunity perhaps in sharing the grace of God. That's not in conflict. So I wanted to, to point that out. But this, this issue of, <clears throat> of abortion, I believe, is perhaps one of the most, if not the most, important issue that we face today. Because let's think about this. And really, it's, it's, it involves our attitude towards it. How do we view it as acceptable or unacceptable? And what links do people go to promote it versus stand against it? Because if we're willing to promote abortion, what's the difference? Because that's an unwanted child. What's the difference or what, what, how big a step is it to say, well, let's, let's practice euthanasia. The older, the older people in our community who are no longer wanted, they're no longer helping society, there may be, maybe people consider them a drain on society, why not just eliminate them? How is that any worse than abortion? Or how about those in society who are less than people think? born with defects or lack certain abilities. But they, they are maybe viewed by some as being unwanted. How big a step is it to eliminate them? And so we see that the, the, the moral difference is not great. In fact, think about this. Let's, let's, let's imagine a, an abortion doctor who is advocating and absolutely pro-abortion, makes a wealthy living off of abortion, and is strong advocate, what's the difference, what's the moral difference between him and Adolf Hitler? We could argue some finer points, but generally speaking, I'm not sure there's a lot of moral difference. And this... This issue is really a gateway. Abortion is a gateway that will easily introduce further atrocities if time goes on. Now, since 1973, roughly 60 million babies have been aborted in the United States. And that's that is close to one quarter, one fourth of all the babies conceived in the last 50 years. Think about that. that. That startled me. I did not realize the magnitude of this. But they say by estimates, there have been roughly 180 million people born in the United States in the last 50 years. Roughly 60 million have been aborted. So you add the aborted to those who are born, that's around 24 million. One-fourth of that 24 million, one-fourth were aborted in the last 50 years. And that can have a devastating effect on society. And thankfully, not everyone is going along with it. And there are, there are those who are, even in the politicians, who are willing to stand against it. And, and it, as I said, it is a moral issue, and human government is responsible for more, some moral issues. Now, it's different than the church. It's different than, than a Bible teacher. But their moral obligations for society are designed and supposed to be in line with a biblical worldview. 
So the God of Molech, the governments that promote that, God will deal with them. God will judge those people. And if a politician today is going to be win God's approval in their, in their actions as a government official, which is God-ordained, but if they're going to have God's approval in their role uh, as a government official, they must be on the side of pro-life. I see no other way around it. <clears throat> now, many Christians think that they shouldn't vote. And maybe, and, and I believe that's a mistake, but maybe even more so now than even in the past because some Christians will look at the candidates and they think, I'm just, I'm just disgusted with both for whatever reason. But it's not about the person. It's about the direction that the country is headed and whether the government is becoming more in line with biblical morality or deviating from biblical morality. That's what it's about. Government, government leaders and officials have never been required by God or anyone to hold to the Christian faith. But they will be judged based on biblical morality and their adherence to it. Because good and evil are defined by the Bible. When pagan religions come in and define them differently, they are wrong. God will judge them for that wrong. Good and evil are defined by the Bible and government officials are to govern based on a biblical view of good and evil. Therefore, I think it is important to vote. And it's important to vote with the, with the issue of biblical morality in view. And as we think about that, <clears throat> we think about, well, there's, there's a host of issues that we consider when voting, maybe the economy, health care, taxes, you know, the list goes on. But from my personal opinion, in today's situation, I find nothing more important than abortion because I can disagree with someone on taxes. I can disagree with someone on the economy and, and, and we can share a lot of other things. I can still trust that person to a certain degree perhaps, but if they're wrong on abortion, if they get that moral issue wrong, I find no reason to trust them with any moral issue. And I'll let you make up your own decision regarding that, but that's, that's the only way I can see it. If they fail to protect the innocent, those who are most innocent among us, what would give them the moral obligation to protect me or anyone else for anything they don't like? <clears throat> now, what should our attitude be in closing uh, to, toward those who have had an abortion? Well, we don't want to go to them in judgment. We want to go to them offering hope because there is hope in the gospel. And we are agents, as, as the government is an agent of wrath, to execute judgment on evil, we as grace believers are agents of reconciliation. That's why we are ambassadors. We are ambassadors of reconciliation. That this, is, this is not a deal breaker. We just simply want to speak the truth in love and give the person the opportunity and a realization they can be fully be made right with God. An abortion doctor, if he chooses, he can... He can change his worldview, line it up with God, place his trust in Christ, and no matter how many babies he has killed, he can still be given eternal life. That's the grace of God. And that's hope. The gospel is the answer. You know, abortion is a sin, but the gospel of grace is greater than sin. Where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. In fact, we're going we're to close with that verse in a minute. But Christ died for our sins. We're all sinners to some degree. 
Christ died for our sins, and Christ is the author of life. When we trust the gospel, Christ gives us eternal life. He gives us spiritual life. But also in John chapter 1, it talks about Christ Himself being the one who gives life and light to every man. God gives physical life to every man. God gives spiritual light in order for them to make moral decisions to every man. He is the life and the light. And when we choose to trust the gospel, we are giving, given spiritual life, eternal life, through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's the restoration that we want to leave people with. We, we don't need to be out Bible thumping, hurting people, beating people up with the idea of just making them feel bad and then leave them with no hope. Because that guilty conscience is what driven, drove people to idolatry to try to satisfy it. The guilty conscience can only be relieved through the gospel of Christ. In, uh, in Romans chapter 5, the closing verses here, Romans chapter 5, verse 20 and 21, it says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. In other words, the law, even the law of Moses, it entered that sin might be exposed for what it is. It's a, so this, not, not to make people sin more, but to expose how much people do sin. But he said, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That has sin hath reigned unto death. Now notice that. What's abortion reign unto? Abortion is a, is a culture of death. As sin has reigned unto death, but what's the answer? Even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So no matter how deep the despair, no matter how bad the offense no matter how much death, the answer is eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, we pray that our eyes would be clearly open on this issue. And Father, we do pray that we would be able to help those who perhaps are hurting and, and struggling uh, through this. And we're thankful that even as you have exposed your will and your, the, the mind of God toward abortion, you have clearly given an answer through the grace that abounds. And so, Father, we rejoice in that. We pray that we would be equipped to, to share that hope and to give that hope to others. And, Father, we pray that we might cast our votes as we are able with this issue in mind. With the, that we might speak up on behalf of those who can't speak for themselves. And perhaps we'll find other ways to speak on their behalf as well. But Father, we pray that we might each one have clarity in our understanding and our thinking regarding this issue and that we would align ourselves with the Word of God. And we pray this all through Christ's name and for His glory. Amen.